In the early 1970s, the idyllic Californian seaside town of Santa Cruz would be plunged into panic. One day there would be a body part found somewhere or washing in from the ocean. Innocent young women were being raped, murdered, and dismembered. He picked up a sack with the remains and then heaved it over. And all the while, the elusive killer was right under the noses of the cops that pursued him. He had a great personality. He was a likable guy. What kind of man could commit such heinous crimes? He would have oral sex with a decapitated head. Was he a terrible product of his environment? His mother would lock him in the basement room at night because she had this idea that he could possibly sexually assault his sisters. Or was the co-ed butcher born to kill? He just erupted. Santa Cruz up through the 60s was a small beach town. It was a surf town and it was a retirement town. Then the university popped onto the scene in 1965. It was the dawn of the, of the hippies, of the age of Aquarius. So there was a very free and easy feel to life here. A lot of the the, uh, the counterculture that essentially bled over from San Francisco area uh, and came down here. A lot of the so-called the hippie types ended up forming communes here in Santa Cruz County. And that was attractive to a lot of young people, and including young girls. And people were coming from all over the country just to uh, live that free and uh, liberating lifestyle. But in 1972, the peace in Santa Cruz would be shattered. All of a sudden, there were bodies being washed in on the ocean. There were grisly discoveries. And the thought was from the, a lot of people in town, what the hell is happening to our little paradise? We were dealing with a lot of missing person reports. It became clear that somebody was killing young co-ed hitchhikers. 18-year-old Fresno college student Anita Lucessa vanishes. A severed head found in the mountain. It was just a skull. We had no body. Mary Ann Pesch, an 18-year-old co-ed and talented skier, disappears. It became a very confusing time for homicide investigators. 15-year-old ballet dancer Aiko Ku abducted. It just seemed like a world gone crazy. Cindy Shawl, 18 years old and babysitting to earn her way through college, goes missing. I, I remember at the time very much wanting to get him. I mean, get him off the streets, catch him, put him away. The media christened the mystery killer the co-ed butcher. Whenever we see somebody under the age of 18 who was hitchhiking, we would pick them up and take them to juvenile hall. And there became a big outcry of that, that we were violating their right to hitchhike. But in reality is that we were just trying to save their lives. And it went on. 23-year-old Rosalind Thorpe vanishes from the Santa Cruz campus. Every time we have a missing person report, we're just fearful that this was going to be another homicide victim. And 21-year-old student Alison Liu disappears forever. We had no clue as to who was doing this. 
They didn't know what the hell was going on. And indiscriminate murder cases are extremely hard to solve because there's no rhyme or reason. Because the culture at the time was, there was a lot of drugs going on here and a lot of the uh, so-called hippie movement. I, I suppose individually we may have thought it may have had something to do with that. In April 1973, as part of a routine firearms inquiry, Detective Michael Alufi would come face to face, not with a drug-crazed hippie, but with a short-haired, conservative young man, popular with local police. The sheriff's office that I worked for at the time uh, received a, what we call a dealer's record of sale. One of our records clerks brought back to us a, a file card and said, you know, this, this guy just tried to buy a gun and his record was expunged, but I could see f through the blackout that he was involved in a murder in Madera County some years ago. Affectionately known as Big Ed, the 25-year-old, 6-foot-9-inch, 280-pound Edmund Kemper was a regular fixture at Cops Bar, the jury room. He would uh, come down to a local watering hole that us police officers would go to after work and uh, hang out and talk with us. He was, uh, had a great personality. He was uh, very friendly, very outgoing, and uh, he was a likable guy. The discussion became, well, who's going to go take the gun away from this guy? Because when you look at his dealer's record of sale, He's six feet, eight and a half, and 285 pounds. So he's a pretty big guy. So being the junior detective, I drew the straw. There was some apprehension involved, um, just due to the guy's size. Big man, big gun, and little old me. Although unfamiliar to Alufi, the gun owner was definitely not considered a suspect in the co-ed killings. Big Ed lived with his mother on a pleasant, peaceful suburban street. But the address was unclear. We parked right there, and we looked around, couldn't find much of anything. There were several places that had basically the same address, so we weren't sure which one was his. We were... I'm just guessing at this point, right around this point right here, when a car came around the curve and pulled up right there where that car is. I told Don, I said, let me go ask this guy if he knows where Kemper is. So as I approached the car, there was a gentleman in the car lying across the front seat with the door open, and he was fiddling underneath the dashboard. And I was just about to this point when I said, excuse me, I'd like to speak with you for a second. When he got out of the car, he got out of the car, and he got out of the car, and he got out of the car. And immediately I knew that this was Mr. Kemper, the man I was looking for, because he towered over me, and I'm six feet tall. So from here, we explained that, uh, you know, what we needed to do, we needed to take his weapon to uh, make sure that he was uh, authorized to have that legally. We came to the trunk. And he had his keys in his pocket, and he went to put the key in there. And so my partner and I instinctively, whether it be instinct or training, separated. And I came around to this side of the car on the trunk, and my partner was on the other side, and we had our hands on the guns. The only thing that was in the trunk was a bundle, like in a blanket of some sort, a towel. He started to reach in for it, and I said, no, wait a minute, let me get it. I reached in the trunk got the bundle and inside of that was the uh, the weapon that we were looking for and I noticed there was nothing in the trunk no liner in the trunk or anything and I thought that was a little strange but we took the handgun and we left Alufi handed the gun in at the station and thought no more about it two weeks later five o'clock in the morning officer Jim Connor is on the night shift when he overhears a colleague taking a call from the gun owner. Knowing Ed, I got on the phone and we, uh, we started talking. I, I could tell that something wasn't right. He was in Pueblo, Colorado. He was in a phone booth and uh, 
he hadn't had any sleep for several days and he said he, he had uh, done something really bad he said that uh, he had killed his mother and a friend of hers he said that they were at his house and uh, he asked me if I knew Mickey and Luffy and I said yes and he says well my house is hard to find Mickey knows how to find it very easily because he had been out there and had confiscated a gun officers contacted detective Luffy at his home I'm standing there getting all this information and giving all this information and I have this tremendous feeling of all of the blood just rushing out of my body it was just oh my god this is unreal one of the deputies broke the back window which is on the other side of the sliding glass door and then we started looking to see if we could locate the bodies in the closet we pulled back a sheet and we saw some hair and some blood then Big Ed Kemper made a startling confession he made comments to Jim Connor on the telephone that he had killed all of the co-eds too taken into custody 24 year old Edmund Kemper would then reveal an extraordinary and sickening tale in the early 1970s the Californian beach resort of Santa Cruz had been stunned by the mysterious disappearance of a series of young college girls and a catalogue of gruesome discoveries. Then in April 1973, 24-year-old 6 foot 9 inch Edmund Kemper unexpectedly confessed that he was the infamous co-ed butcher and that he now had a tally of 10 murder victims to his name. Taken into custody, he would now reveal his extraordinary story. The co-ed killer had such a fascinating life. Born in 1948, Edmund Kemper was the middle child of three. His mother and his father were very strict disciplinarians. There, there was no uh, leeway one way or the other. Growing up in Burbank, California, Kemper looked up to his father, but had difficulties with his mother, Clarnell. She was a punitive person that he resented greatly. She was harsh, aggressive, um, Putting him down, I think, when he was younger, call it verbally abusive, I don't know, but very, uh, very aggressive verbally. In 1957, after years of unhappy marriage, the nine-year-old Edmund's parents divorced. Clarnell, Edmund, and his two sisters moved away. Kemper was already behaving oddly. He showed a lot of pathology as a child. He would cut off the heads of his sister's dolls in other ways, deform the dolls. At 10, he had made a comment that if he ever had to kiss his teacher, he would have to kill her. And when you think about a 9 and 10 year old at that point, having that kind of a thought process, you begin to wonder you know, what is it about him? The young Kemper was developing a violent fantasy life. He moved from dismembering dolls to harming animals. He admitted once burying a cat alive, later digging its body up to play with. There's many, many serial sexual murderers that have a background of killing cats, torturing cats, tormenting cats. Why cats? Because cats are a female symbol. Kemper was showing warning signs that the FBI have since identified as common amongst a number of serial killers. Basically, you're dealing with a uh, young 
male that is engaged in fantasies that are aberrant and destructive and violent before adolescent. You're looking at an individual that has a broken home, uh, a cold and distant mother, uh, a absent father through divorce or, or just abandonment. They get into animal torturing. There are patterns that are identifiable. Kemper grew taller, stronger, and stranger. His mother put him in the basement room and would lock him in at night because she had this idea that he could possibly sexually assault his sisters. He described it as having um, a cot and a sleeping bag and uh, a light hanging down from the ceiling with uh, just a bare bulb and a string. Talked about it as being a very difficult time in his life, very scary. He could hear rats running around at night, that kind of thing. As a teenager, Kemper left his mother heading to Los Angeles to seek out the dad he idolized. He had hoped to go and live with his father and he described to me that uh, when, when he went there he was rejected by his father. Edmund Kemper was sent to live with his paternal grandparents on their remote farm. Here the troubled teenager's violent fantasies would be realized for the first time. He found his grandmother to be an authoritarian and a disciplinarian, like his mother. His grandfather was out shopping or whatever, and um, he took a, a 22 and, and shot and killed his grandmother. When he realized his grandfather would be coming home and finding his wife dead, they were, they were elderly, um, he decided he couldn't allow his grandfather to go through that trauma so when his grandfather came in he shot and killed him he said he didn't want the grandfather to suffer knowing that his wife was dead it's the most bizarre statement I mean you don't go out and just shoot somebody to keep them from finding out that their wife is dead Kemper was diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic and sent to the secure Atascadero State Hospital. That was a, a very harmful place for him to be institutionalized. He certainly learned a lot of bad things. Dr. William Schanberger was one of the facility's staff. In those days, we had 1,600 patients in the hospital. There were probably several dozen uh, people who had uh, committed murder. 800 mentally disordered sex offenders. Uh, we had psychology staff of only 10 people or so. Although not Kemper's therapist, Schanberger would have regular contact with the inmate. Ed is a bright fellow, and, and that was obvious when you were talking with him. Uh, he was kind of a model uh, uh, patient. The likable Kemper soon became a trusted assistant to the psychology staff that dealt with the hundreds of sex offenders. He had so much access to the records, and there would be detailed descriptions of the methods used. In, in carrying out the crimes, uh, techniques of deception. Remember, he was 15 when he went into the mental hospital, and he really had never had any sexual experience at all. Generally, what you'll find is that the child will uh, pursue these violent uh, fantasies, and in adolescence, the sexual element will come on board and they will have sexual fantasies uh, that develop along the lines of uh, uh, using people as an object rather than a partner. Uh, they want to do something to somebody, not with somebody. He had a fantasy life. He described himself as masturbating n numerous times during a day when he was in the mental hospital. As part of his duties, 
Kemper had access to the hospital's psychological test papers. Uh, Kemper was very smart. Uh, he knew what uh, psychiatrists and psychologists wanted to hear. He knew all the criteria for different diagnoses. Uh, they treated him, and I think they thought they cured him. After five years in the secure hospital, Edmund Kemper, now 20 years old and six feet nine inches tall, was released. He was uh, discharged, by the way, uh, to the youth authority with the recommendation not for him to live with his mother. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, youth authority uh, didn't follow that advice, and uh, he wound up living with his mother. His social life, I'd say, was very inadequate, as he described it. Uh, he felt particularly inadequate around women, so I think he was lonely. Here is a young man, he, he's 21, 22, and he probably never had a date in his life. Probably have the usual uh, interest and needs uh, to connect with women. What can you tell someone about yourself? That uh, I murdered my grandparents and I was in a mental hospital for the last five years of my life. I, I, I can't imagine how difficult it would have had to be. Uh, that doesn't excuse anything, but it, uh, in my mind, describes the situation. So he started picking up coeds, and uh, some of them he wound up murdering and, uh, and doing even worse things at times. In custody, Edmund Kemper would reveal to investigators the full horror of his extraordinary crimes in minute and graphic detail. It's about as serious and complex series of, of sexual uh, pathologies as I've come across. He said a lot of things that they're kind of disturbing. In 1973, after the disappearance and murder of half a dozen young college girls, detectives held Edmund Kemper in custody. and the six foot nine inch killer was eager to talk. Leading detectives to the scenes of his crimes, he would explain his murders in chilling detail to anybody who'd listen. He talked and talked and talked and uh, just gave every bit of information you could ever dream of. And he goes into great detail about the things that he did to these girls. Most of the serial killers I've worked with fall into two distinct types. One group of serial killers will never like to talk about uh, their offending behavior at all. Whereas the second group of serial killers are desperate to talk about their killing. They're desperate to be at the heart of the story. He, um, he said a lot of things that they're kind of disturbing. Investigators learned how Kemper had taken months to develop his strategy for abduction. He spent a lot of time traveling all over Central California and even down into Los Angeles. And what he would do is he would find hitchhikers and he would essentially do a practice run. As he would drive off with, with the uh, young women, he would look, look over at them, think about fondling the breasts and have and, and have great sexual curiosity about them. Over numerous trips, Kemper honed his harmless persona and perfected his plans. Only then did he feel confident enough to act out his fantasies. On the 7th of May, 1972, Edmund Kemper picked up two 18-year-old friends, Mary Ann Pesch and Anita Lucessa, near the university campus in Berkeley. They would get in the car and he would drive off and immediately he would say, oh, I don't think your door, car door is closed. And he's huge, he's a big man. He could reach all the way across the car, open it, close it, 
and then he would drop a chapstick behind that mechanism. So if they became afraid or they wanted to get out, it wouldn't allow the mechanism to work. Kemper drove them to a remote spot. He told detectives that holding the girls at gunpoint, he had forced Anita to climb into the trunk. He then returned to the car and stabbed Mary Ann until she was dead. Just think about Anita Lukesha in the trunk, listening to her best friend being stabbed and hearing her screaming. I mean, you know, it's pretty, pretty heavy stuff, actually. Kemper then opened the trunk and killed Anita. He took the dead girls to an apartment he was renting. There he dismembered them before dumping their remains in the mountains. All the while, the police hunted the mysterious co-ed butcher. The seemingly harmless Edmund Kemper was sitting next to them in their favorite bar. I remember Ed being there on many occasions, especially during the time of the homicides that were going on. He would come in and, and have a few beers with the guys. He was a likable guy. While he was with them, he was able to uh, think about, here I am, an ongoing murderer, and uh, they don't know anything about it, and, and they fully accept me, and I'm one of the boys. He, he was a police groupie, actually, is the best way of describing it. Many serial sexual murderers have a fascination with police. That's part of their psychology. And they do that for a number of different reasons. Uh, to hang out with them was one, but they also sometimes can follow the investigation and see if they're talking about it at all. This is very stimulating for them. It was just talk about, you know, a girl found here, a girl found there, and, and body parts washed up on shore, and this kind of thing. It was a conversation among the guys uh, when we were at the jury room. On the 14th of September, 1972, Kemper spotted 15-year-old ballet student Aiko Ku hitchhiking. She'd missed her bus and was worried about being late for a dance class. She had made a sign because she missed the bus. She needed to get to San Francisco. She was very young, small, easy to overpower. Got in the car. He drove across the bay to San Francisco, but unfortunately for her, just kept going. This little girl was terrified, obviously. Kemper bound, gagged, and then suffocated his captive. But it was only when Kemper took his victim's bodies home that he could fully act out his twisted fantasies. With most of them, he would actually uh, have intercourse with the dead woman. He would uh, have sex with her entire body, then sometimes also with the decapitated body. And then sometimes he would have oral sex with the decapitated head. It's not unusual for a serial murderer to have sexual actions with a decapitated body. It's, it's because it's not a person to them. To them, it's, it's an object. I have the power to do anything I want with this woman. She's mine. And I can, I can do anything that I'm curious about, do anything I've only dreamed about doing, and nobody can do anything about it power is a big part of it, but extreme sexual pathology is another. In order to evade detection, Kemper would separate his victim's body parts and dump them in different locations. One spot, just minutes from Detective Terry Medina's home. When I did find out that he was up here, 
that that was uh, that made me reflect on my wife you know we had two small kids up here and uh, she would be home alone a lot so that gave me kind of a funny feeling in the pit of your stomach he was a predator Well, this is, uh, would be uh, approximately the place that uh, Kemper uh, parked the car. Very remote. It was even more remote uh, 30 years ago than it is today. There, there was nothing up here then. It was just in the mountains. Picked up a sack and then carried it right to the edge. Uh, and remember, there was no fence here heaved it over and that was the remains of Aikuku. Of all of these murders, that's the one that I think affects me the most as I think about it. I mean, they're all brutal, but that one just seemed to stick with me. There's, there's some, those of us that do murder cases, there's always some that seem to, to get inside you. Kemper would go on to claim the lives of three more co-ed hitchhikers. 23-year-old Rosalind Thorpe, 21-year-old Alison Liu, and 18-year-old Cindy Shaw, babysitter to police officer Jim Connor's kids. She was young, uh, you know, she needed money like anyone else. She was very pleasant and uh, Knowing that she was a student at the university, we felt very safe uh, that we could, you know, trust her with our children. He had shot her with a uh, 22. Kemper took Cindy's body to his bedroom in his mother's apartment. He had dismembered her, but in his mind there was some relationship there. He had an attachment, and he kept her head. Kemper told detectives he'd hidden Cindy's head in his mother's backyard, beneath his bedroom window. He buried it, and it was about two feet down in the backyard, facing his bedroom window, so that there was some connection in, in his mind. It was unbelievable, because Ed seemed like, excuse the phrase, uh, a gentle giant, you know, with a very nice personality and likable kind of guy, uh, that he could be responsible for something like that. In addition to the murder of his grandparents, Edmund Kemper had taken the lives of six young women. Next, he would commit a murder he dreamed of all his life. By March of 1973, six feet nine inch Edmund Kemper had kidnapped and murdered six female co-eds without attracting suspicion. But in April, Detective Michael Alufi's routine visit to confiscate a firearm had unwittingly sent the suspicious Kemper into panic. This whole process of me taking the handgun away from him he was under the impression that I was playing cat and mouse with him. He thought we were playing a game, that we really knew he was the murderer. Kemper worried his mother, Clarnell, would now learn of his actions. He did not want her to suffer the embarrassment of what he did. Edmund Kemper resolved to finally commit a crime he had fantasized about since he was a child. He uh, got up at four o'clock in the morning, took a hammer, went into his mother's bedroom, just jammed that hammer through her head several times. That was a, a very messy murder. 
Kemper's mother would suffer the same fate as the young coeds, and more. He cut off her head, and then he inserted his penis into her mouth. Put it on the mantle above the fireplace, and just yelled and screamed at it. And at times he threw darts at her face. He talked about all the time she had screamed at him and yelled at him or belittled him. He cut out her vocal cords and tried to destroy them in the uh, garbage disposal unit at the sink because it was her chastising him using those vocal cords that, uh, that so bothered him. Fearing his mother's death would soon be discovered by her best friend, Kemper invited her to the house, murdered her, and then fled. It was only after driving for three days without rest that he called the police and gave himself up. Detective Medina was sent to the mother's apartment to process the crime scene. When we arrived, there was nothing disturbed. It looked like somebody had just left on vacation. We flipped over the mattress, and of course it was soaked with blood. And there was a note there. He left a note that said, sorry, gents for the mess, but really had no time. That's the first time in my career, and I've been in this business 43 years, that, you know, the suspect left the cops a note. The bodies of Kemper's mother and her best friend had been carefully hidden in two closets. In October 1973, Edmund Kemper would be tried for multiple murder. Both prosecution and defense searched for the answer to the question on everyone's lips. Why would uh, this large, friendly, cooperative guy, uh, why would he kill all these people? Defense investigator Harold Cartwright spent over a hundred hours interviewing Kemper. I never at all felt threatened at any time by, you know, 260 pounds or something, you know, six foot eight or whatever. And he's an enormous man, but he was just a, sort of like a gentle giant. But it seems Kemper's demeanor with the opposite sex may have been very different. Cameron Jackson, a graduate psychology student at the time, was asked to perform a standard personality test on him. I was the only person in the room with him, and I, I read the questions to him, and, and he, was, he was very cooperative. And then suddenly, just out of the blue, he simply, he both sort of started to get up, and he just, he just erupted like a volcano of... And he's, ah, like that, and, and his hands and everything. And I just went like that, backwards. And in immediately came one or two policemen who uh, calmed everything down. It was just so fast and such an overwhelming rush of anger and emotion and fury. I don't really remember the exact question now that I was asking, but I'm sure it had something to do with women. <laughs> and I was a woman asking him questions. In the courtroom, Kemper's taped confessions were played aloud. I recall that sitting in the trial, listening to the taped confession of Kemper and looking around and seeing the face on the parents of the murdered girls, just the, the shock and the agony and what they had gone through. In the coverage of, of these terrible crimes, I think the most neglected aspect are the, are the victims. Uh, 
There's a brief mention of their names usually. These were all young college girls. They were working towards a career. They might have chosen to have a family. All of that is lost when a murderer uh, comes along and, and takes them away. What a tragedy. In those families where a young woman was murdered and taken away, the tragedy of that is as much alive today as it was back in 1972. On the 8th of November, Edmund Kemper was found guilty of eight counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. So what drove Kemper to take the lives of ten innocent victims? Was it his broken family life and the alleged emotional abuse from his mother? Or was he simply born to kill? He only once said something like, it was the way I could control them. And that's the only thing he ever said the entire time I dealt with him that had anything to do with why he did what he did. Ed Kemper is the classic uh, sociopath. He feels no guilt. It's all about him. No compassion whatsoever. It's, it's very difficult to say how he looked at what he was doing. Would a person who walked in a, into the, a butcher have remorse about cutting up a chicken? I don't know. I doubt it. And uh, I think that's what he looked at. Uh, an object that he could dismember. You know, you look at him and you say, okay, something happened, his wiring was crossed, uh, he had a chemical imbalance, he had, he had something, and then you look at him and you say, no, this is strictly environmental. You know, the way he grew up, um, the, all the life experiences that he, that he had led him to the point that he becomes this serial mass murderer. Maybe he was killing his mother all along. Who knows? I think when we're all studying serial murderers, we want to find something to blame. Uh, it's got to be this crazy mother that he had who locked him in the cellar, but she must have felt something. You know, people who are around serial killers for a period of time will pick up some type of a feeling. They can't describe it, but they know something. There are genetic and biological factors there are sociological factors and there are complex psychological factors, all of which interact. And if we're going to ever reduce and prevent these things, we have to attack it on all these levels. I don't think anybody is born to kill. I think everybody is born with a series of pluses and minuses in their makeup, both physically and, uh, and mentally and emotionally. Uh, I think that things happen to people. Most people are able to uh, cope with it, deal with it. Some people are not. Several years after Kemper had been incarcerated, a parcel arrived at the home of psychiatrist Dr. William Schanberger, who'd been friendly with the teenage Edmund. I received in the mail this cup from Ed Kemper. It said that it took uh, him about a year to make, uh, and it's a very, very complex, it's like a battered uh, cup. And on the cup is written uh, also, uh, I beg your pardon, and on the bottom, I never promised you a rose garden. Meaning to be, I think, a very serious apology. I think there is a side of him that would have given anything to be a normal person. I could see that in him. I could see it while he was testifying. There's a part of Ed Kemper that is as horrified and as disgusted with what he did as the rest of us are. I'm sure that uh, there's no part of him that is happy with uh, what, what he wound up doing. The series continues same time next week. You can find out more about serial killers in our crime files at crimeandinvestigation.co.uk slash serial killers. Next tonight, we're on the deadly trail of a brilliant scientist.